Welcome to your moment for biblical truth, a show in which we honor the name of Jesus and use the Bible to study the Bible, to better understand the Bible, giving full glory to the Word of God, looking toward the Old Testament as a schoolmaster, not to be forgotten. A show in which we are taught by inspiration of the Holy Spirit of God. And now, here is your host, Brother Esquire. Good afternoon. I am Brother Esquire, and I'd like to welcome you to this edition of Your Moment. Biblical truth. Now, today's show is going to be called The Heart of the Law of God. And by the end of this show, I hope to have helped you to better understand how to go about and use the law, but use the law according to the heart of the law instead of using just the law according to the letter to beat and bash everybody into submission. Okay? Now, this show is in response to a show that I made about homosexuality, in which I got a lot of backlash from my fellow Christians, and I kind of knew they would. I kind of knew I would get some backlash, but that's okay because I'm a big boy, I'm a grown man in Christ, I can take it. But with that being said, all you did was motivate me or inspire me to come up with my next message that is entitled The Heart of the Law, because... A lot of us say we're Christians, but then we also turn around and say we are under the law of God. And if we are, then something is not right somewhere. As good as this sounds, something is not right. So, with that being said, I want to go ahead and get into this message, you understand? Because when it comes to the law of God, the question arises about its place in the world where Jesus has been crucified for the remission of sin. What is the use of the law of God if the world has received the forgiveness of sin? And also to that point, what is the difference between the law of God and the heart of the law of God? Are they the same thing or are they different? And this is a valid question. Because a lot of Christians use the law of God to beat and bash the ungodly into submission. And then turn around and say, no I'm not, when they are confronted by saying they are. And it is for these reasons that I want to try to clear up some facts about the law. Now, the first thing you have to understand is that there may be over a billion people on the face of the earth, but in general, when it comes to the law of God, there are only three groups of people. And they are those that are under the law of God, those that fulfill the law of God, and those that are without the law of God. And being able to identify what person belongs to what group can help assist you in how to approach that person with the gospel of Christ, as well as reveal to you, to yourself, how deep your own personal walk with God really is. Now, to start with, we're going to begin with those that are under the law of God. And these are those that follow God they spend their life trying to keep the law of God in accordance with the commandment of God that tells us, Thou shalt keep my commandments and principles and ordinances all the days of your life, and I shall be your God. These are those that judge in accordance to the law of God, being that it is actually right to do so. However, these people run into a dilemma. They have the problem of being right in their judgment in accordance with the law of God, but wrong in the execution of the law of God themselves. They forget that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, Romans 3, verse 23. They forget that no man can fully keep the law of God because the law of God by its very nature is both spiritual and holy. And man by his very nature is both rebellious and sinful. Romans 7.14 Moreover, the law of God is perfect. Psalms 19 verse 7 And if you say you are keeping the law of God but also admit to yourself that you are not perfect then you are also admitting that you are failing the very law that you are trying to keep. And because of the nature of the law and that the law itself is holy, and to allow one sin will make the whole thing unholy. If you say you keep the law of God and yet fail it in one area, then you are guilty of failing the law of God in its entirety. As the prophet tells us, 
For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. James 2, verse 10. And as for the argument of saying that, well, my sins are not as big as the next person's sins are, that argument falls apart the moment you finish saying it. Because in the eyes and mind of God, no one sin is above another. This is what prompted the prophet to write. For he that said, thou shalt not commit adultery, also said, do not kill. Now, if you commit no adultery, yet if you kill, then you are become a transgressor of the law. James 2, verse 11. You can't say, I do this, but I don't do that. Because then you become the very person that Paul was talking about when he wrote Romans 7, 15. And I quote, for that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that I do not. But what I hate, that I do. And again he says, if then I do that which I would not, then I consent unto the law that it is good. That means I am telling the law that it is good. For the good that I would, I do not. But the evil which I would not, that I do. Romans 7 verses 16 and 19. And simply put, you tell people to do stuff that you don't do while telling them not to do stuff that you yourself do. And you yourself do it on a regular basis. And this is what makes it dangerous for you to use the law of God to try to beat and bash or judge anyone into submission. Because not only are you failing the law, but your judgments in accordance with that law is unjust. Because you go around and judge everybody else for being wrong for doing stuff that you yourself refuse to judge yourself on to be wrong for doing. And in my opinion, and this is my opinion, this is the biggest mistake that people make when it comes to the law in that they don't use the law of God to rightly judge themselves because that is exactly what the law of God is here for. Understand? Yes, the law of God was given to a nation, and if that nation can keep the law of God, then that nation can be declared a holy nation, but the core of the law of God itself is aimed at at the individual. Moreover, the ten most famous of these commandments prove my point. It doesn't read, we shall not steal. It doesn't read, y'all shall not steal. It doesn't read, people shall not steal. It reads, you, meaning you individually, personal, on a personal level, and nobody else, you shall not steal. You shall not kill. You shall not commit adultery. And if you cannot keep these laws along with not rightly judging yourself on your own failure when it comes to these laws, then you are in no position to tell others to keep the law of God and put a burden on them that you yourself have proven that you cannot bear. Nor are you in any position to judge them by that law because your judgment is biased because you yourself transgressed that law. Moreover, the law itself does not justify a man of anything in the sight of God. Galatians 2, verse 16. In fact, it is because of the law that sin now lives and we are under the constant threat of condemnation. The prophet puts it like this, and I quote, For I was alive without the law once. But when the commandment came, sin revived, meaning sin became alive, and I died. Romans 7, verse 9. For sin taken occasion by the command deceived me, and by it slew me. Romans 7, verse 11. Meaning, sin fooled us into thinking it was right by feeling good and appearing to have a form of righteousness while using the law to kill us by showing us by the law that everything we are doing is against the law. So then, in a sense, sin acts like a virus that is lying dormant in the body of all men, and it has a 100% kill rate. And it becomes active the moment the conditions become right inside the body. And those moments are right or the conditions are right the moment a person begins to learn the law of God. And it kills you the moment you realize that the wages of sin is death. Because it is at that moment that you realize that you are already dead spiritually. Not only that, you are in danger of the second death which is reserved for all the ungodly and unholy of men being that the law itself is holy. This is what prompted the prophet to write, the sting of death is sin. 
And the strength of sin is the law. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 56. So then, for a person to boast in the law and yet do what they don't allow to be done, while not doing what they know should be done, using an unbalanced scale to give out judgment, the whole time using the law to beat and bash others into submission, the prophet speaks directly to you. And I quote, Who knowing the judgment of God, that they which do such things are worthy of death, not only do the same things, but take pleasure in them that do. Therefore, you are inexcusable, O man, whosoever you are that judges another. For wherein you judge another, you condemn yourself. For you that judge do the same things. And think you this, O man, that judge them which do such things and do the same, that you shall escape the judgment of God, who will render to every man according to his deeds? For there is no respect of persons with God. For as many as have sinned without the law shall also perish without law. And as many as have sinned in the law shall also be judged by the law. Romans 1, 32 and chapter 2, verse 1, 6 and 11 through 12. So then, if the law doesn't justify a man, and no man can fully keep it, and men are sinful, but the law is holy, and men are carnal, but the law is spiritual, then what exactly is the point of the law? Because we are carnal, and the law is spiritual. We are not holy, and the law is holy. So what is the point of it? And to this, the point of the law is exactly what the law is. The law is holy and spiritual. And at its core, it is meant to edify the individual in the ways of godliness and holiness. And so that is exactly what the law is here for. It is here to edify the individual in the ways of holiness and spirituality and godliness. The law reveals to us what sin is. The law says these are the ways of holiness and those are the ways of unholiness. These are the acts of righteousness and those are the acts of unrighteousness. These are the ordinances of God and those are the ways of ungodliness. The law of God is the absolute yes or it is the absolute no. The law of God is given to direct and to instruct the man of God in the ways of God. Now, although we will talk more about the law, I want to take this time to talk about the second group of people, and that are those that fulfill the law. These people love God with all their heart. Their life is for God to do whatever he pleases with. However, these people also have Christ. They walk by faith and not by sight. They are spiritual and not carnal. These are those who show forth the commandments of God as having been written and engraved in their hearts and minds. These are those who do not simply keep the commandments of God just because they are the commandments of God and that sells it for them. They keep the law of God by walking in love for God and out of their love for God. These are the ones who have come to the understanding that you cannot say that you are a follower of the Christ of God and yet still claim to be one that is under the law of God. And to prove my point on what I just said, because what I just said might be controversial to some people, to prove my point on what I just said, when it comes to the top ten of the commandments, if you keep the first four, then you will do them because you love God. And in order to keep the second six, you will only be able to keep them if you show forth that same love towards men. To further my point, the prophet puts it like this, Owe no man anything but to love one another. For he that loves another has fulfilled the law. I'll say that again. He that loves another has fulfilled the law. Because for this, thou shalt not commit adultery, you shall not kill, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, you shall not covet. And if there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love works no ill to its neighbor. And so, therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. Romans 13, verses 8 through 10. Furthermore, 
on this. Furthermore, Galatians 5.14 says, For all of the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And add to this love of God that they are walking in, they also have Christ, which means they should be walking in faith. And by this, they not only fulfill the law, but they are the ones who establish the law. You see what I'm saying? Once again, the prophet writes, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Jesus Christ, whom God has sent forth to be the propitiation through faith, in his blood. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith. I'll say that again. We conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. By faith, we establish the law. Romans 3, verses 24, 25, 28, and 31. Faith takes a long, hard look at the law and says, yes, I will keep you. But I will keep you out of my love for God. But it is not the law that justifies me to God. It is my faith in his plan of salvation that lies in the redemptive blood of his Christ that justifies me to God. And as for my doing of the law, that simply serves to show forth to the world that I actually am a child of God. And this is because although Romans 5.1 tells us we are justified by faith, we are also told, but will you know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead. James 2.20 and 26. And when it comes to this faith of Christ, this goes hand in hand with walking in the spirit and leads directly into anyone trying to use the law of God to judge anything. And this is because the righteousness of the law is fulfilled in those who walk in the spirit of God. I'll say that again. This is because the righteousness of God is fulfilled in those who walk in the spirit of God. They are the ones who allow the spirit of God to live and work through them. When these people judge, they don't just judge according to the law of God. They also allow the Spirit of God and the Spirit of Christ which dwells in them to judge the situation in its totality. And their final conclusion is that of the Holy Spirit in them and not of their own. And in fully doing this, by allowing the Spirit to take hold and take the judgment, they not only give righteous judgment through the righteous spirit of God in them, but they are also the ones who fulfill the righteousness of the law by walking in the spirit. Understand, God is a spirit, and the law is spiritual. If any man seeks to please God, then they must learn to walk in the Spirit. And by walking in the Spirit, you put yourself on the path of obtaining the righteousness that the law itself was never able to allow a man to obtain. Which righteousness can only be obtained by not performing the law, but by realizing that a man must become more than a natural man. A man must become more than a carnal man. A man must become a spiritual man. So then, the people who fulfill the law do so by walking in godly love. They established the law by faith in the redemptive blood of Jesus Christ. And they fulfilled the righteousness of the law by walking in the Spirit. And being that I want to touch more on this group, I'm going to just simply come back to them later because I want to use this time to go ahead and talk about the third group of people. And that group of people is the lawless ones. Now, what you must understand about these people is that being called lawless does not necessarily mean that they have no law. They are called lawless in that they are without the law of God, but these being without the law of God still have a law unto themselves. These are those who do what is right in their own eyes. They allow what they feel or think is right, and they don't allow what they feel or think is wrong. And they judge in accordance to their own thinking and logic and standards. With this group of people, they may be lawless, meaning without the law of God, but having their own laws. But there can and will be times when their laws are in full agreement with the laws of God. However, don't be deceived because this does not mean that you are following God's laws. 
you are still following your laws. And this is because you do not believe in God. So to you, God is not real, and therefore you cannot be following God's laws. You see what I'm saying? Now, with that being said, and being that the rest of the teaching on the lawless would actually tie into something else, I want to stop the teaching on the lawless and tie all three of these groups in together. Now, when it comes to the law of God, we are told by the prophets, wherefore the law is holy, and the commandment holy, just, and good. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandments of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. For truly I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no ways pass from the law, till all be fulfilled. Romans 7, 12, Psalms 19, 7 and 9, and Matthew 5, verse 18. And what this means is that the law of God is still valid in a world where Christ has been crucified for the remission of sins. And I'll say that one more time so it can sink in. The law of God is still valid in a world where Jesus has been crucified for the remission of sins. The law of God is good for converting the souls of men. When a person chooses to follow the laws of God, they begin to come in line with the ordinance of God and the statutes of God. And as the prophet already told us, the statutes of God are good. So a person who chooses to submit to the law of God is going from doing what they feel is right to doing what is right. And there is wisdom to be had in this because there is a way that seems right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Proverbs 14, verse 12, and this point was so important that the prophet felt compelled to write it again in Proverbs 16, 25. So then, a person who is going about doing what they think is right is in danger of following the ways of death. And this they do by allowing themselves to be fooled by sin into committing sins that have a form of righteousness but are actually not right. And being that they think the sin is right, they commit more of the sin and more of the sin and more of the sin until their mind frame is beyond the point of rebuke and they begin to take pleasure in those that also commit the sin. Nor can they see or understand how sinful they are in the eyes of God because the laws of God are dead to them. Not to be confused with them being dead to the laws of God. The prophet puts it like this. Was then that which is good made death unto me? God no. God forbid, no, 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 my brother, that which is good was not made dead to you, but it was made sin, that it might appear sin working death in me by that which is good, that sin by the commandment might become exceedingly sinful, Romans 7, 13. So then, by a person going around doing what they think is right, but is actually sin, they are planting within themselves the seeds of death, because the wages of all sin is death. Moreover, being without the law of God will not excuse you from the judgment of God. And this is because besides the law of God, men would also be judged according to that which is in their heart. And this means if what is in your heart is your own set of rules and regulations and laws, then you will be judged out of your heart according to your own set of rules and regulations and laws. They are not God's laws. They are your laws. But even so, were you able to keep them? You spent your life telling people what to do or what not to do based upon your own logic and thinking, but did you do it? Did you do what you said to do, and did you avoid what you say to avoid? Or did you indulge denying yourself not the whole time condemning others for doing it, yet secretly taking pleasure in them because they do? Understand this. No man will escape the judgment of God. All have sinned. 
all, A double L, all have seen it come short of the glory of God. And on the day of judgment, God will prove that fact to every man by showing them that they are without excuse because they not only broke his laws, but they broke their own laws. And being that most of them won't have Christ, they are ultimately guilty of the rejection of the Lamb of God for the remission of sins, which regardless of how sinful you are, will ultimately be the only thing that stops you from getting into heaven. And this is because without the blood of Christ in your life, you have no remission of sins. And you are without the remission of sins, having your sins remaining in your name, not written in the book of life. Understand, a person who's written in the book of life can fall away and have their name blotted out. But your name will never have been written there, having never have accepted the Lamb of God. And for a person to say, well, I am not godless, I have the law of God, you do well. But don't forget that God can raise up children unto Abraham from mere stones. So, to say I have the law of God, so I am better then the next person is not good because there is no respect of persons with God. A person with a heart for Christ and God and having the laws written on their hearts, a person with a heart for God, serving God by the letter of the law, or a lawless person without the law of God, but having a law unto themselves will all be judged according to what is in their hearts, what is missing from their hearts by their own laws, by the laws of God, and by the gospel of Christ. And the prophet puts it like this. For as many as have sinned without the law shall also perish without law. I said this before. And as many as have sinned in the law shall be judged by the law. In the day when God shall judge the secrets of men, that is the hearts of men, by my gospel, which is by Jesus Christ. Romans 2, 12 and 16. Now, being that the lawless have no hope, and those that are under the law cannot be justified to God by the law, then there has to be something else, Brother Esquire. And I have to say, yes, there is. And this something else is what you may have heard a hundred times before. It is Jesus. This something else is grace. And this statement is in full agreement with the word of God written by the prophets. And I quote, for the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. John 1.17. So then Jesus is the key. Jesus is the way. In order for a person to have Jesus, they have to have faith. They have to have faith that Jesus is the Lamb of God. Faith that his blood was shed for the remission of sin. Faith that Jesus is everything he said he was. And it is through this faith in Jesus that you begin to tap into the grace of God. And it is by this grace or unmerited favor that we are justified to God. And this justification came by the grace of God, sending the word his son full of grace, in whom was the redemptive blood of the new covenant proclaimed at the last supper. And this is where it all breaks down. Because you cannot bring the law of God into the new covenant, at least not the law written in the letter. Because the law makes guilty, but grace justifies. Moreover, we are told, Know you not, brothers, for I do speak to them that know the law, how that the law has dominion over a man as long as he lives. Let me say that again. The law has dominion over a man as long as he lives. That whatsoever things the law says, it says to them that are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Romans 7, 1, 3, 19. So then the law has dominion over a person as long as they live. But those who are in Christ are crucified with Christ. They are become dead to the life they live. They slayed their old man and walk in newness of life. The prophet puts it like this, and he speaks very clearly and plainly when he does. Know you not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism 
into his death. Then like as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body that you should obey it in the lust thereof. For sin shall not have dominion over you. For you are not under the law, but under grace. You are not under the law, but under grace. And because of this, sin cannot have dominion over you because sin is only for those that are alive and you are dead in Christ. Being then made free from sin, you have now at this moment became the servants of righteousness. Romans 6, 3, 4, 6, 7, 12, 14, and 18. So then, those that are buried with Christ are dead to the law and walk in the spirit. But that could be a contradiction because we are also told that the law is spiritual. But this is exactly my point. Understand. The law is spiritual. So only a person walking in the spirit can fulfill it. But a person walking in the spirit won't deal with the law according to the letter. They are going to deal with the law according to the spirit and love and let grace do the rest. In other words, and listen to what I'm going to say. Those who are in the spirit will be about the work of the Lord even when the work of the Lord puts them against the law of God. Let me say that again. Those who are in the Spirit will be about the work of the Lord, even when the work of the Lord puts them against the law of God. And you will say, well, Brother Eskar, that will never happen. But, to prove my point, we need only to look at the life of Jesus. Jesus healed on the Sabbath, which he wasn't supposed to do. Exodus 20, verses 8 through 11. The woman with the issue of blood was unclean, and so when she touched Jesus, it would have made him unclean. Leviticus 15, 19. Jesus chose not to stone the woman caught in the act of adultery. John 8, 3, and 11. In each of these cases, there was a law against what was happening, but in each of these situations, Jesus was about the work of the Lord. So then, in each of these situations, Jesus acted in accordance with the spirit that was in him and allowed the grace of God to condemn him or justify him for his actions. Now, when it comes to the law, we are told, knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and for sinners, for the unholy and profane. 1 Timothy 1.19. So then the law is not made for a righteous man. That's what I just said. But the only way to obtain righteousness is to walk in the spirit of righteousness, which in effect would mean that the law isn't made against those who walk in the spirit. But being that they walk in the spirit, they are the ones who are able to administer the law because they walk in the spirit. So then for those who choose to keep the law, you will never fulfill it. But you will forever fail it. Now, the difference in what I call the law being dead to you versus you being dead to the law is the difference between faith and and unbelief. A person who does not believe something won't submit to it because to them it is not real. It is as good as dead to them. But on the other hand, a person who believes in Christ must be fully sold into that fact. They must fully believe that Christ is their sacrifice and in his blood is the atonement of sin. They must truly believe that they are dead to the law of God and live through Christ, free to serve God in love and in the spirit, truly at peace with God, being finally able to please God. Because if not then they are faced with the fact that they are still under the law of God which they believe and that their sins remain. So then, 
The takeaway from all of this is, and I quote, and please listen to me, whatsoever the law says, it says to them that are under the law that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God, because by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin, but now the righteousness of God without the law has been manifested. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, Christ unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely through the grace of redemption that is in Jesus Christ. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. A man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. By faith, we establish the law. By love, we fulfill the law. By walking in the Spirit, we fulfill the righteousness of the law. And by faith of Jesus Christ, we manifest the righteousness of God without the law and are justified freely by His grace through the redemptive blood that is in Jesus Christ. And I will be elaborating on this in just about a minute. Now, with all that has been said, when it comes to using the law to judge, what is the difference between judging according to the law versus judging according to the heart of the law? And the difference between the two is the difference between a man serving God according to the letter of the law out of commandment versus serving God according to the spirit out of love. When you judge according to the law, your judgment is definite. There is no mercy in it, and it is unforgiving in that someone makes a mistake. There is an action that must be made to make it right with God, and if they don't do it, then their transgression will forever remain, and they will forever be guilty of it, and that which they must do to redeem themselves must be in accordance with the law which they have transgressed. However, when a person judges according to the Spirit, they are not judging in accordance to their spirituality. They are not judging in accordance to a person trying to be spiritual. They are judging in accordance to the very Spirit of God that dwells in them. On their hearts is written the law of God, but within their bodies dwell the very Spirit of God. So then when a person like this is confronted with a situation, they know what is right. And they know what is wrong. And they know what the judgment according to the law is. However, they allow the Spirit of God in them to fully judge the situation in its totality. And they allow that Spirit to have the final say as to what the judgment will be. And when it comes to the Spirit of God being allowed to do this, we are told by the prophet, For I desire mercy, not sacrifice. And the knowledge of God more than burn offerings. But go you and learn what that means. I will have mercy, not sacrifice, for I am come to call the sinners to repentance, not the righteous. Hosea 6, verse 6, Matthew 9 and 13. We are also told, beloved let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone that loves is born of God and knows God. He that loves not knows not God, for God is love. No man has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwells in us and his love is perfected in us. Hereby we know that we dwell in him and him in us because he has given us his spirit. That is how we know we dwell in him and him in us and his love is perfected in us because he has given us of his spirit. Whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the son of God, God dwells in him. And he in God. Herein is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. 1 John 4, 7, 8, 12, 13, 15, and 17. These people have boldness in the day of judgment, because within them lies the very Spirit of God, and the love of God has been perfected in them because of that. 
So they have no worries when they stand in front of God. So then, the Spirit of God is going to judge out of perfect love, and he will have mercy or pity on the soul of a sinner, and grace will take care of everything else. The lady with the issue of blood touched Jesus' hem and was healed and then addressed directly by Jesus, who did not condemn her. But, and this is a but, because this is something we never really looked at. The woman should not have been there because she was unclean, and she knew it, but she had faith. She knew that she was about to touch a lot of people when she got into that crowd, which would have made them unclean, whether they knew it or not. And she knew that was going to happen, but she had faith. She knew if she touched Jesus, it would have made him unclean, but she had faith. And it wasn't just any old faith. She had the faith of Christ, which beckoned her in her unclean state to act opposite of the very law she was trying to keep. And this fact is what made her a manifester. I'll say that again, a manifester. This fact made her a manifester, a bringer to life of the righteousness of God without the deeds of the law. Because she still attained something. And this is because her faith in Christ justified her for being in the crowd. The grace in Christ justified her to God. Her faith in Christ justified her for touching all those people in that crowd. But the grace in Christ justified her to God. Her faith in Jesus justified her for touching the hem of his garment. But the grace in Jesus justified her to God. So then, because of her faith in Jesus... God freely justified her of her actions that were clearly against the law. And as for the judgment of Christ on the situation, he could have turned around and scolded her and told her to leave because he knew she shouldn't have been there. But he turned around and knowing and understanding the laws and knowing the law that she was breaking, he judged her in accordance with the spirit of God out of love. And he took mercy on her when he said, daughter, be of good comfort. For your faith has made you whole. Matthew 9, 22. Then there's the woman that was caught in the act of adultery. Fully knowing the hearts of those men, he challenged them to prove that they were perfect in the law and they failed. But they were right in their judgment. Fully knowing that she was an adulteress, he did not accuse her. Fully knowing the judgments according to the law, he did not condemn her. Fully knowing that she should have been taken and turned over to the proper authorities, he let her go. And out of love, Jesus took pity on the woman and simply sent her on her way with her people by saying, Go and sin no more. John 8, verse 11. Now, a person would say, well, now, Brother Esquire, that don't make no sense. Because the law is given for us to place our judgment on what's good and bad, but now you're telling us that we can know the mind of God on any given situation to be able to judge that situation in accordance to the mind of God. But no man should be able to know the mind of God. That is impossible. Our judgment is from the law. That is what the law is given for. And to this, I would have to say, well, first of all, it is not impossible it is just uncomprehendable by a person that refuses to look deeper. Second of all, it does not defeat the purpose of the law because the law is not here for us to know the mind of God. The law, as I said earlier, is here to prove the ungodly and the lawless while instructing the man of God in the ways of holiness, godliness, and the spirituality. And as for the question of how can a man know the mind of God on anything, I'll simply let the prophet himself answer that question. And I quote, But as it is written, I has not seen, nor ill heard, neither has entered into the hearts of men the things which God has prepared for them that love him. For them that fulfill the law. 
For God has revealed them unto us by his spirit. For the spirit searches all things. Yes, I mean all things, even the deep things of God. For what man knows the mind of another man except the spirit of the man which is in him? Likewise, the things of God knows no man but the spirit of God. Now we have to receive not the spirit of this world, but that spirit which is of God. Now we have to receive that spirit of God. We have received that spirit of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God, which things we also speak. Not in the words which man wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Ghost teaches. Comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But he that is spiritual judges all things. Yet he himself is judged of no man. Because he is judging according to the Spirit of God. And how can you yourself come back and judge the Spirit of God on his judgment? For who knows the mind of the Lord that he may instruct? But we have the mind of Christ. 1 Corinthians 2, 9 through 13, 15, and 16. Simply put, on what I said, the mind of God is revealed to those in whom dwells the very Spirit of God, because the Spirit of God has the mind of God, and it searches all things, even the deep, secret, and hidden things of God. Always remember, to judge with love and mercy according to the Spirit of God is to judge in accordance with the heart of the law of God, which is love thy neighbor. God will have mercy. Judge according to the Spirit. I'll say that again. To judge with love and mercy according to the Spirit of God is to judge in accordance with the heart of the law, which is is love. And never forget, the judgment you give will be given back. If heartless and merciless, you will get it heartless and merciless. If with love and compassion, it will come back to you with love and compassion. So please don't be quick to condemn other people. Now, that is the end of the message. However, within the message, I left out something. See, a person would try to say, well, Jesus would never do something that was against the law. But remember, I already told you that Jesus did heal on the Sabbath. He did not turn in an adulterer's. And he did not rebuke a lady that was unclean that was in a crowd. But more than this, Jesus went into the home of publicans and sinners, and he ate with them. So then Jesus came into the house of the sinners. That is why he said, I'll come into the earth, and I will come to your house, and I'll knock, and if you open the door, I will come in. Understand, us Christians, we cannot keep this gospel to ourselves. Give it out. Give it out. Give it out. Jesus has already knocked on your door, and you have opened it, and he has come in, and he has supped with you. But after that, he went back out into the world, and he's looking for more people. And beyond that, he left you with the task to do the same. Keep the gospel within the church to strengthen us in our faith, but do not try to keep the gospel within the church to say that it belongs to us because Jesus told us, I am not come to call the righteous to repentance, but the sinner. And if you cannot understand what that means, then go your way until you know what it means because to say that I know is to say that you are guilty of it because you know. This is the point Jesus was trying to prove to the Pharisees. See, it wasn't the fact that they were wrong about telling Jesus several things. They probably were actually judgmental to the highest degree on what they were saying to Jesus. But they were actually right in some of the things that they were telling Jesus. But Jesus, who is the Lord and has the Spirit of the Lord in him, was judging and walking and acting according to the Spirit of God and the love of God that was in him. And so he dealt with every situation different than what they thought he would do. He healed the woman with an issue of blood that shouldn't have been in a crowd. He let an adulterous go that should have been turned over. You see what I'm saying here? He went into the house of a sinner and a publican. And more to that fact, the 12 apostles that were with him started off 
as sinners at some point in their life. The ones that came to John were repentant sinners and went to Jesus. And the ones that Jesus picked up were picked up while in their sin. Understand. The gospel is for everybody. So do not keep the gospel within the church. The gospel is here, and the church is what gives the gospel. The church is not what holds the gospel hostage. The church is what gives the gospel. So this I challenge you. If you are in the church and you are talking about judging others according to the law, I challenge you to stop that today and start to judge people in accordance with the heart of God and see if your judgment changes. Because God will have mercy. Because no person is lost and completely unsaved until it is too late. And it is not too late until Jesus comes back. So, with that being said, let's give out this gospel. And let's stop condemning everybody for being sinners. And let's try to save those sinners. And let's stop trying to chop off the arms and toes of the body of Christ by telling other people that preach things you shouldn't preach this. If what they preach is in accordance with the gospel of Christ. Because even Christ would tell you to leave him alone because he who is not against him is for him. You see what I'm saying? So, with that being said, if I have helped you to better understand the difference between the law of God and the heart of the law of God, in that the law of God is according to the letter, but the heart of the law of God is to judge in accordance with the Spirit of God. And I'll say one more thing. God took mercy on the first murderer that ever lived, so how can a person say that God himself wouldn't take mercy on you all these years later? God took mercy on Cain and banished him. But more than that, God put a mark on Cain, and that mark, a lot of people want to say it was a curse. The Bible didn't say it was a curse. The Bible said it was a mark to let everybody else know that you should not kill this man because God has taken mercy on this man for the judgment that he gave this man. He had already judged the situation of his situation of his him killing his brother and he banished him but he put a mark on that man so that no man can come back and try to pass judgment on Cain for what God had already passed judgment on and try to kill him for that murder. Is what I'm saying. Now, with that being said, if you want to come to the Lord, and you want to come to understand the difference between the heart of the law and the law of God, and you are a Christian or that is, watch this channel just to see what I was going to say, and you just tuned in, then I thank you for watching, but would everybody bow their heads and pray with me as we welcome in these brothers and sisters into this wide church that is growing so, 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 so ever largely every day. Lord, I come to you fully knowing that I am not right. I know your laws, but now I understand, Father, that it is not just your laws, but you want them on my heart. You want me to circumcise my heart and become righteous. You want me to become spiritual, Father. This day, I choose to do just that. Lord Jesus, come into my life. I accept your sacrifice on the cross for the remission of my sin, for the atonement of my sins. Father, look at me and see me as I am and forgive me. And dwell in me. And work through me. And allow me to pass righteous judgment that your righteousness may be established in all the earth. In the name of Jesus, I pray unto you. Amen. And amen. Now, if you have prayed that prayer with me, then I truly believe that you have become a brother of mine, a sister of mine, a mother of mine, a child of God, a brother, friend, daughter of Christ. Um, it behooves us to show our faith. So go forth and get yourself baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. If you can't do that at the moment or you are in a situation where that would be not good to do, openly yet, at least don't deny your faith. Go in your bathroom and 
Close the door, fill your tub up with water, bless that water in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and dip your body in it and come back up in faith, truly believing that you have just been buried and risen again in the name of God and Jesus Christ. And I promise you, all will be well, because it is faith. And that would have been a very powerful demonstration of your faith. And when you get the chance, you can tell people later. But just get yourself right first. Now, with that being said, I am Brother Esquire saying thank you for tuning in to this edition of Your Moment for Biblical Truth. May God bless you. May Jesus bless you. May the Holy Spirit walk with you and guide you. I love you and shalom to all the world. May you have a blessed year. I'm Brother Esquire saying...